Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Colony Drop, your favorite Gundam podcast. My name is Isaac. And my name is Brian, and this is a podcast where we talk about anything and everything related to the Mobile Suit Gundam franchise. From the anime, to the movies, to the models, to the music, to the food, everything and anything. You name it, Isaac, we do it. That's absolutely right. We talk about whatever pops into our mind. And today we have a fun topic, Isaac. Top five favorite mobile suit weapons. Fun five favorite fighting firearms. <laughs> <laughs> mobile suit combat is always dependent on the weapons that they carry. That could be anything from uh, physical melee weapons to types of energy weapons, projectile weapons, uh, even special you know, type of uh, very exotic weapons, right, Brian? I mean, it, it in Gundam and all the Gundam series, it really runs the gamut in terms of what types of weapons you run into. That's right. There's so many different ways to categorize these things, and we've, you know, Gundam is so is so long running that we've seen so many different cool and unique weapons over the years. So it's I found it really difficult to choose only five favorites, Isaac. So I think in the future, we may need to blow out this series a little bit into like favorite ranged beam weapons, favorite ranged physical weapons, favorite melee beam weapons, that kind of thing. So I I tried to hit a little bit of everything here, but did, did you have trouble getting down to five? Absolutely. And let me even put like an asterisk next to my my five selection because that's almost a three or four way tie. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I know that's kind of cheating, and like some of those should technically just be moved into like honorable mention. But uh, <laughs> still, you know what what can I do? The other top four are pretty <laughs> solid, but man, it was it was a hard battle for five. <laughs> do yours have a specific order, or do you feel like they're just kind of the top five in general? No. So today, listeners, we're going by top five favorite weapons. Now, favorite hoods, you know, favorites, <laughs> favorite hood. <laughs> there's fatherhood, there's brotherhood, there's sisterhood, there's motherhood, there's favorite hood. Uh, <laughs> we've entered favorite hood and neighborhood. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, favorite is something that's very personal to everybody. Listeners, I'm sure you have a favorite mobile suit. You have a favorite series. You have a favorite character, favorite color everything (laughs) so going along that lines brian and i picked our favorite weapons top five just off the top of our head top five favorite mobile suit weapons not mobile armor not ship mounted not super weapon just mobile suit equipped so that means i ranked it as number one being the one i like the most and number five being i like it but clearly four through one took up space as priority how about you did you approach it the same way i tried to i tried to i don't know if i was successful because a lot of uh, my five are very different because i I wanted to get a bit of variety here absolutely because we're not limiting it here we're only doing five i I tried to limit myself to one weapon per timeline interesting and so i do have one super weapon on mine which you you can probably guess what it is based on that yeah my approach was like just the ones that i like personally Let's see, looking at my list real quick, about half are from uh, from non-UC, there so that's go. interesting. The other ones are <laughs> UC, and that's, I think, listeners, when you make your own list and you comment that into the comments, I'd be surprised if it wasn't slightly, at least, majority UC, just because there's more UC content, right? If you're a Gundam fan, you're a UC fan by <laughs> default. But now I'm kind of curious. You really cherry-picked. You went out of your way to cherry-pick from different universes, so very interesting, Brian. I did, I did. You know what? Enough teasing. Enough foreplay. <laughs> Let's jump into your number five, Brian. All right. We're going to start off easy here, Isaac. This is something I've talked about before. So my number five are the Excalibur anti-ship laser swords that are equipped on the Sword Impulse Gundam. Wow. <laughs> These are two very large physical swords that have, they're not like a total beam saber, Isaac, but they have like that beam edge, right? When he like turns it on, a beam comes across the the part where you would you know slice someone with right and so these are designed to cut through ships you know how cool is that right (laughs) not if you're in the ship (laughs) yeah yeah, that's true yeah (laughs) good point if you see the sword impulse flying towards you (laughs) in a capital ship you you know you're in for bad time you might as well just abandon ship if you're on the bridge like i don't know do do you bother do you bother taking out your sidearm and like you know putting it next to your temple or do you just like well (laughs) that beam of light will be quick enough anyways (laughs) i don't think you'd even have time yeah yeah you issue that order to turn around (laughs) immediately and and hope for the best 
Uh. <laughs> uh, but it kind of reminds me of just the Amuro, uh, you know, in, in 0079, how he would just land on ships and just kind of tear them apart. So this was like the updated version for Gundam Sea Destiny. And while I don't really think that highly of Gundam Sea Destiny, it's not one of my favorite shows. But these things were pretty darn cool, Isaac. And they can even be combined into that dual-bladed Darth Maul-type weapon. I think they, they call it the ambidextrous form, I think, is the, the official name, which is really odd. I wouldn't have called it that. They need a better name than that. But Yeah, that's terrible. You know, call it, like, the ship killer form or something. Par for the course for Gundam Seed naming. <laughs> <laughs> probably true. Probably true. So I love these because they're way too big to be taken seriously, but the show does take them seriously, similar to, like, Cloud's Buster Sword in Final Fantasy or Guts' Dragon Slayer in Berserk. And so it's just a shameless, like, big swords are cool and I think they're fun. I also think, after I thought about it, why I like these Isaac, I think I have a thing for swords that have side guards. And if you've ever done kendo or any type of sword fighting <laughs> and you've been hit on the knuckles with, you know, whether it's a shinai or whatever that, whatever you're practicing with, a side guard is, like, a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Like like a quarter of our listeners, knowing our demographics, like they probably nodded, like yeah, that did happen to me. <laughs> yeah, like it really hurts. <laughs> that did happen when I was using a boken or a shinai. <laughs> exactly. So it just it's common sense, you know. Put a little extra thing on there. So, and and another cool thing about these swords, Isaac, is this is what Shin used to destroy the uh, Freedom Gundam. Of course. Yeah. So that's my number five: the Excalibur anti-ship swords. I didn't even realize they were called Excalibur. That's kind of cool. Yeah, the, it's cool, but like they lost it when they went with ambidextrous. <laughs> yeah, that's we we don't mention that. Boy, Brian, you went big, and uh, yeah, go big or go home, right? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> okay, my number five. Is it okay if I present a three-way tie? <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna stop you. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll start with earliest appearance to later. So five A. <laughs> will be the standard Zeonic bazooka that you see used by like Zaku's and also Dom's mostly by Dom's as time went on right because mm-hmm. they were very good at using like their little you know the flourish that they do <laughs> they right. always yes. like they zoom in <laughs> they hover in and then they shoot like the rocket and then they do like this like little ballerina spin <laughs> they gotta juke them to get, a different a, get direction. away <laughs> yeah right like I guess to reload but <laughs> It's like they're playing flag football and they do the spin move. Yeah, exa- yeah, they they pass the football and then they they, they spin. <laughs> twirl, it's the Dom twirl. I always thought that was very iconic to like the Doms and um, it was all something fun to see. That bazooka almost always ended up killing some poor GM or vehicle or something. Never the Gundam, but no. anybody else. Anybody else like that rocket made its made its hit. <laughs> So I, I always thought those pretty iconic, and if I was piloting a Dom, I'd probably want to shoot those. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, my other selection, 5B, this is a machine gun that it was so rarely seen in the one-year war. Like, I, you, you might see it a couple of times at a bow coup or something. It's the MMP-80, which was the replacement to the kind of standard Zionic machine gun for, for mobile suits like Zaku's. So instead of having that one that had like the big drum uh, ammo on top, the MMP-80 had the sort of a, you know, clip type attachment underneath it. And I always thought it was such a cool looking design. It's very kind of efficient, um, aggressive looking, very evolved Xeon. Of course, it didn't really help, but it always was a <laughs> machine gun that stuck out to me. And I was like, okay, this thing looks pretty cool. I wish we had more of them. 5C is also something that's, uh, I went big, Brian. I went big big Uh oh this is the nuclear bazooka used by unit 2 from 0083 i was wondering if this would be on your list (laughs) well now you know (laughs) you know me well brian so for those of you who i don't know how you'd forget but (laughs) for those of you that that don't remember uh the nuclear bazooka was stolen by anna valgato along with unit 2 and a nuclear warhead it was used at solomon island well Conpei Island, excuse me, formerly known as <laughs> Solomon, to attack the uh, the Federation Naval Review, destroyed a majority of the fleet. It ended up being more powerful than Gado, and I assume the designers of Unit Two thought because it damaged Unit Two upon firing. <laughs> so yeah, beyond repair, really, or at least enough to abandon it. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, so that's my number five, and it's the reason it's my favorite is because that's such a an epic scene, such a an almost horrifying in many ways scene. Mm-hmm. 
it always left an impression in, on me. It's right up there with, you know, the finale of 0083. The nuclear bazooka is definitely iconic. Have we seen any other mobile suit use a similar nuclear bazooka? I don't think so, right? No, no, not to my knowledge. Ironically, you think in Seed, like, they would have been, like, I don't know, Blue's Cosmos Gundam, and, like, right. all it has is nukes <laughs> or something, <laughs> right? It's, like, only designed to attack the plants. But, no, we never saw that. Instead, <laughs> Blue Cosmos, like, they send their nukes in, like, the weakest little space fighters they can, the weakest little Mobius mobile armors they can. <laughs> so. Do you think Blue Cosmos on their nukes do you think they spray paint for a blue and pure world absolutely they have to you know as as much as that that organization has infiltrated the uh, the earth alliance they absolutely <laughs> put like even more than that brian there's obscene anti-coordinator profanity <laughs> on the <laughs> nuclear missiles going back to the mmp80 so i i really like that one as well yeah i guess the question for you on that one is isn't that one associated with the zaku kai which you don't actually like yes that's a good point so this machine gun came out later it was designed more to counter mobile suits so i think i believe i believe it had smaller ammunition but i think it was more armor piercing or something mm -hmm. like that compared to the original machine gun that the zakus had that was probably kind of universal for anti-armor against type 61s or anti-air against like uh you know whatever aircraft the federation would have or, or spacecraft yeah. and stuff but uh yes this is associated with the zaku kai which i don't really care for because of its bizarre proportions and hideous red cockpit <laughs> but it's still a great solid looking gun it's got such a, a great design look to it yeah it strikes me as like hey if we redesigned the zaku machine gun to look more like a real gun what would it look like yeah we went from like kind of a, a tommy gun s thing to like something that's way more assault rifle ak-47 type xeonic rifle right yeah all right brian what's your number four moving on up the list my number four is not going to be for everyone but for those of you who like Super Robot shows, or your blood burns hot enough, then you will love it. It's the Shining Finger, or the God Finger, or the Burning Finger, whatever you want to call it, is used by the Shining Gundam, or the God Gundam, the Burning Gundam, by Domon Kashu from G Gundam. If you don't recall Isaac, this is where Domon focuses all the Gundam's energy into his hand. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and then he rips through the mobile suit, either, or well, in the Shining Gundam, he would just blow the head up right he would grab their head and smash it but in the, yeah. in the in the god gundam or the burning gundam he would shove his hand through the mobile suit like basically into their body and then uh, he would use the heat end attack and, and sort of release all the energy and then blow up the suit from the inside you know domon eventually uses the, the the god finger to do other techniques like the god finger sword the burning finger sword the sekiha ten kyoken Plus, there's it's this great theme song that goes along with it, Isaac. You know, they mention it in the in the opening. They're like Shining Finger. You know, we've talked about that already. How that's a great song. Yeah, it's such a straightforward attack. It's it's like you know choosing the fighter class in any game where you just you you know that dude is like coming right at you. He like he doesn't really have a separate plan of attack. He's literally just kind of like you know beat you up with his fist. The nature of it is very much Domon. You know, when he says like take this, my love, my anger, and all of my sorrow. It's like one blow. It's very personal. It's not a gun, right? Domon using a gun would make no sense. <laughs> you gotta love uh, the shouting of the attack name. The dub VA did a great job. Mark Gatha erupting Burning Finger. How can you not like that? I mean, come on. <laughs> and Isaac, did you know that Mark Gatha is now retired from voice acting? No. He only worked from 2002 to 2006. But he did Domon during that time, and he also did X for Mega Man X. But now he's retired, and he's uh, apparently an orthopedic surgeon in Canada. Wow. I mean, it, what, what's the saying in life? You go through five careers or something like that, you know? So quite the turn, but good on him. Yeah, maybe he used it to pay for, you know, medical school or something. But uh, <laughs> I, I wonder if he does those things. What do they call them? Cameos or something where you can pay the voice oh, actors yeah. and they'll do a, a, a voice for you for, like, happy birthday or whatever the hell you yeah. want to send someone. I, wanna, I totally want to do that for a friend. And I, it would be so cool to get him to do it. I wonder if I wonder if he just hates voice acting now or something. But I'd hope not. Yeah. Do you do you think he like says it before surgery? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he is a surgeon. You're right. I don't know. He, yeah. He's like washing his hands and he's like burning finger. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope so. 
And then nur- like, all the nurses and stuff in the operating room, they just kind of like roll their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> that or they swoon, one of the two. Yeah. You know how like during surgery, like they listen to music or something, right? Yeah, yeah. So like maybe they just put on episodes of <laughs> G Gundam. <laughs> Yeah, and they have him say his lines. Yeah, it's like, oh, this was a cool episode. I fought the devil Gundam in this <laughs> one. <laughs> so I hope that's true, Mr. Gatha. So. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool. What, I mean, as we all know, I'm not the, the biggest G Gundam fan, but what was so unique about this is this might be the only gun, well, okay, a little bit in Crossbone, but no other Gundam has its hands literally as the weapon right this is unique across all series really yeah i mean may, unless you want to argue like gundam maxter like right he was kind of like a boxing mode i would argue still that the hands weren't the weapon so much as like the shoulder covers the, that became yeah. like the spiked punching gloves right the closest is the juagu <laughs> 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 with its little you know rocket hands of death <laughs> <laughs> that just sliced up that that gym yeah, yeah, that poor guy. Yeah, <laughs> good, good choice, Brian. Honestly, I I didn't see this coming because um actually ooh uh oh uh oh listeners comment below if you think that doesn't really count <laughs> because <laughs> it's not a weapon per se that like the gun well actually no it has to count right because like a chest firing beam that would still be considered a weapon. Yeah, you know, a yeah, totally. Okay, okay. I was about to, to to troll you a little bit, Brian, by saying <laughs> it doesn't count because technically it's not holding the weapon. <laughs> you were about to earn yourself a, a god finger, I see. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, Can you imagine if he comments? <laughs> I had to delay surgery after listening to Isaac. <laughs> I had to stop this tomfoolery. <laughs> you drive to your house. And you're like, yeah. let me show you something. <laughs> you fool. All right. <laughs> He would knock down your door with an erupting, Pretty, burning yeah, with finger. Yeah, with a burning finger. <laughs> All right, Isaac, number four. Okay, my four. I also went big, Brian. This weapon is from maybe like my favorite setting, non-UC mm. setting. It is, to an extent, the cause <laughs> of that oh. setting happening. And let me explain. My choice for number four is the satellite cannon from After War Gundam X. Yes. For those of you who haven't seen the series, the satellite cannon is a weapon almost in its own category. It's technically an entire weapon system. During this setting, there's a war between the colonies led by the Space Revolutionary Army and uh, United Nations Earth. The colonies threaten to drop almost every colony on Earth. And in response, the uh, United Nations Earth send out this new weapon, Gundam X, with a satellite cannon. This weapon on its own, on its own, is capable of one-shotting an entire colony and destroying it. And we actually see that in the intro where they're explaining the background of the war and we see this uh, small group of the Gundam Xs fire off their satellite cannons. And just like it says on the box, Brian, one hit into the colony destroys it completely. So this thing is really powerful. And that's what I like about it. Not that just that it can, you know, destroy colonies outright, but that it might be the only weapon in any Gundam series where it's sort of the linchpin of the story. And it shows up throughout the story, really, as just sort of this looming threat that just is tacked onto the back of a Gundam. So for that reason, it's my number four as being a favorite weapon because of its importance in the story, its sheer power, and uh, how, how really unique it is in terms of uh, Gundam weapons we almost never see. Well, what a coincidence, Isaac, because my <laughs> number three was also the Gundam X's satellite cannons. Oh, you catalytic cannons. Oh, you went with double X. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, all the iterations, the satellite cannons. Of course. The twin satellite cannon, whatever. I have one when you can have two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? When, they up- when you get the mid-season upgrade, why not just add another one? In the story... Did they just put on another cannon or did the original United Nations Earth have like a model of the Gundam that had two cannons? Like it almost seems overkill to hit one colony with two cannons, right? From now, it's been a long time since I've watched the show. We'll, we'll obviously have to rewatch it. I recall it being a new Gundam. I don't think it, it was older. I remember it being an upgrade because I believe when the Gundam X was charging the satellite cannon that it really couldn't move or couldn't defend itself. I think the Gundam Double X, the twin cannons allowed it to use its arms so it could like defend itself. Right. Um, so maybe that was the reason. Okay. Listeners, if, if you recall offhand, let us know. Yeah. 
so I agree with everything you said. I think the only extra things I'll mention are this feels like such a very 90s concept to me. And even though it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, I love it with the whole like, you know, the, the solar power station on the moon, which sends the energy to the Gundam. Right. I'm not really sure how that works, but, <laughs> but like <laughs> the concept is great. And, and I wish, for example, that intro could be reanimated and expanded today because I think seeing it in modern animation would be super cool. Yeah, that that's a good point. They do kind of hand wave it away, right? Like, well, there's this big solar grid on the moon, and I I guess it faces the sun a lot, <laughs> <laughs> and you know we we just microwave beam all that energy to directly to the Gundam, and it puts it into its cannon, and it it blows up colonies. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. It begs yeah. the question: Why couldn't the station just be the Death Star? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> there's no there's no good answer for that either right because like if you say well the station was always at risk of attack it's like well in that case why didn't like the space revolutionary army just blow up the base then they right. never have to worry about the gundams you know <laughs> yes yes exactly i mean i guess maybe you get more flexibility if you could aim it a little bit better via the ganon or something but i don't know oh actually wait oh spoilers didn't dome on luna have its own defenses like m- maybe there's a case of Dome's only able to defend the base, but mm. it's not exactly leaving the base. It's not exactly sending its little G-bits to defend the base. Yeah, the, G- the, the G-bits were the defense, right? Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's a case of, well, we can't attack them, but they're really not attacking us. The, the other thing I'll mention is I love how they incorporated the X shape into the satellite cannon. Because it, it, yeah. you know, it's in the name of the show. I thought that was pretty creative. But uh, Absolutely, yeah. So here's a question for you, though, Isaac. Uh Uh-oh. I think U.S. Gundam fans largely love big guns because of Wing Zero's buster rifles. Interesting. What do you think is more powerful, the Wing Zero buster rifles or the Gundam X satellite cannons? Ooh. Because I believe the Wing Zero buster rifles also destroy colonies in one shot, or we at least saw them do that, right? Yeah, they could. it It was within their power to do that. Right. Definitely take out Libra, too, or at least chunks of Libra. But the colonies are maybe not the same size, perhaps. Yeah, I'd imagine colonies are smaller. I'm going to say the satellite cannon is stronger. That'll be my head cannon, unless I'm told otherwise. And let me explain. Just like you said, pretty much, Taurus colonies seem to be smaller than O'Neill cylinders. So going off that and the fact that Jared Garoto from uh, Gundam X, when he attacks the colony laser that the Space Revolutionary Army built... Like, that thing was massive and, I assume, somewhat more armored than a regular colony. Yeah, fair. So, since he was able to one-shot that, that thing by default has to be way more rugged and defensible than anything we saw in After Colony. So, for that reason, I'm going to say, yeah, it goes to the Gundam X. What are your thoughts? Yeah, to me, the the Gundam X satellite cannon just feels more powerful, just based right. on like what you see in the show. I agree. It it seems like the after colony colonies were a little smaller. I don't know about you, Isaac, but I feel like the Wing Zero Buster Rifles felt more powerful in the TV series than they did in Endless Waltz, right? In Endless Waltz, he couldn't even get through Mary Maya's little bunker thing. Yeah, that's true. Good point. But in the TV series, he had no problem just taking out those those colonies. And maybe the setting was different, or maybe he had it dialed down. I I don't know. But I think that'd be an interesting question for the listeners. What do you think? Satellite cannon? Or the twin buster rifles. Let us know. Ooh. Yeah, please keep it like technical and logical <laughs> in your explanation. And let me explain. Don't turn it into like, did you like Gundam Wing or did you like <laughs> Gundam X? <laughs> yeah, this is you know, start a war here. Yeah, that, ha- that has nothing to do with the actual weapon's performance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Isaac. Well, that was my number three. So carry us on. Number three. Okay. Number three is it might be the only type of weapon I've seen that kept a continuous beam that was held by a mobile Mm. suit. And Brian, you're going to like this one. I don't think you saw this coming, if I say so myself. (laughs) This is the Blash XBRX 79YK long-range beam rifle used by a gym sniper in the jungles of Southeast Asia in 8th MS team. This sniper fired this beam sniper rifle at the escaping Zanzibar and it blew it out of the sky. This wasn't just like, you know, a quick little beam shot. No, this thing was like an ex- an extended continuous solid beam, like a lightsaber, <laughs> really, <laughs> that like extended hundreds of meters into the sky, hit the Zanzibar and blew it up. 
it, it's a weapon I've never seen used again. <laughs> Maybe because it requires its own little external power pack. But it, it was so cool to see. It had so much destructive power. And I, I can definitely see how maybe they'd want to use it again in situations where they had to destroy an ace specifically on the battlefield or a command position on the battlefield, some special target, something like that from a long distance with a guaranteed way to kill it. I love it. That almost made my list. I I had to (laughs) really stop myself from putting it on the list. Visually, it was such a cool weapon, right? Because like you said, with the constant beam, we don't see that a whole lot. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we all know I'm not the biggest gym fan, but this seemed like such a cool thing. It was very Ryer. Like only Ryer would have such a sneaky, (laughs) lethal weapon. (laughs) So kudos to him for like pulling this out of wherever he had it and, you know, telling that sniper, again, position, this peace little situation is going to last. Fire when I tell you. And <laughs> and it worked. So, yeah, kudos to being such a cool weapon, a unique weapon. And I, I guess Federation Energy Technology never really caught up because we never see a continuous beam like that from a mobile suit ever again. Yeah, I can't recall it being used in another series, but maybe listeners, maybe you know of one. But I kind of like, right, that it that it was special because it, it had that extra generator thing. So you, you knew that, like, everyone couldn't have this, right? If everyone all of a sudden has that a year later, then it's not as special anymore. Yeah, that's that's true. From from what I read also that it, I think it was the only mobile suit equipped uh, weapon that could match, like, the output of, like, a cannon that would be mounted on a, a ship. So mm, it yeah. was it was that powerful. It might have been knowing the Federation, it was too costly to produce. So, you know, at once the wartime economy ended, they're like, We really don't need to make more of these. Yeah, and then I guess plus probably as we go on in the timeline then mega particle cannons start appearing like on mobile suits and stuff, so maybe they just kind of evolved past that and, and got the same performance. Yeah, why have beams when you have particles? So there you go. All right, Brian. What's your number two? All right, my number two is probably buoyed by some recency bias here, but my Uh-oh. number two is uh, the Barbatos Lupus Rex's tail blade, which was salvaged from the Hashmall mobile armor. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't see this coming. <laughs> yeah. So the Hashmall reveal of, of just mobile armors in general, and then the Mika versus the Hashmall battle, uh, those are some of my favorite parts of Iron-Blooded Orphans. And the fight was so great. And so then when they kept one of the most devastating parts of Hashmal around, which is the, what's called the, the tail blade is actually called the super hard wire blade. I thought that was a great move, like creatively to kind of keep it around in the show and show how Mika was progressing in his sort of brutality. He was uh, sort of losing his humanity a bit, right? He was losing his ability to move outside yeah. the Gundam. And so he was growing more into the Gundam because now he, now he literally could mentally control a tail. And it was cool. It was like a trophy, right? You know, he, he went through all this trouble to destroy this mobile armor and he got something out of it. It's not entirely new because we, we've had wired weaponry before, Isaac, right? The, the noise eel had the wired claws. We saw some wired stuff earlier in the timeline as well. But right. we've never really had a mobile suit with a wired tail, to my knowledge, have we? No, I mean, tail mobile suits are rare enough as it is, but no, we've, we've not had a tail one. <laughs> I mean, a wired tail. Yeah, and and he was carving up everybody, Isaac. He, you know, he was kicking ass with this thing all the way up until the unfortunate Dainsley's bombardment <laughs> um, at the end of the show. But I, that thing was brutal, man. I loved that thing. In their defense, like... How often do you train to find an opponent that's going to like swing a tail at you? You know, it's it, there's there's no training for it. <laughs> no, totally fair. Yeah, but they you know they don't give a whole lot of background about it, but in the show. But this is what the wiki says about the super hard wire blade: a blade with high hardness attached to a wire made of a special alloy. It is mounted at the back of the head and cannot be reproduced with current post disaster era technology. At room temperature, the wire's special alloy is viscous and can bend flexibly when charged with a trace amount of electrical current. The weapon can move easily in any direction and can be used to launch surprise attacks from blind spots. So check out that. They didn't even they didn't talk about how the the wire is like somewhat liquid at, at room temperature during the show. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and I enjoyed seeing it. Like everything else in in Iron Blooded Orphans, it was just so unique along with the whole series. So if there's ever a sequel, I hope they somehow salvage the super hard wire blade from the wreckage of the Barbatos spoilers 
and we uh, and we see someone else use it again because clearly I'm I'm sure it didn't get destroyed in the battle. Um, it's probably just laying there on the floor, so just c- covered in Mikazuki's blood. Oh uh, well, <laughs> yeah. So that's my number two for right now. I thought it was super unique. So take us to number two, Isaac. Well, as luck would have it, my number two is also from Iron Blooded Orphans. Mm. Brian, I think you can guess what weapon I chose from Iron Blooded Orphans. I think I can. <laughs> is it the Dane sleeve? <laughs> that's correct. I chose the Dane sleeves. The Dane sleeve listeners is it's essentially a railgun. It's yep. this massive kind of harpooned arrow shaped railgun that amounts to this uh, launcher that's almost looks like a giant bow and arrow or the yep. bow really mm-hmm. crossbow maybe. It's equipped on mobile suits and the mobile suits fire it and it has such incredible speed, power, and range. You can pretty much be in orbit, launch it, and w- within seconds it, it impacts on the ground. So it's it's very difficult to dodge, and when it does land, it does incredible damage. What's also cool about this weapon is it had a big role in the story. It was originally really the key to humanity, well, part of the key to humanity defeating mobile armors. So this is what we know it's important. And then beyond that, even, it was deemed so powerful that they were mostly outlawed, or at least there was a stigma to using them. Gallahorn, the villains in the show, fabricated Tekadin <laughs> using Dane sleeves just so they could pretty much have a, a public excuse to kind of put their hands up and say, well, they're, they're using, you know, unlawful illegal weapons. I guess we have to also to save humanity. <laughs> <laughs> oh shucks! Let me go dig it out of storage. I'm so bummed about this. <laughs> How convenient! Our whole fleet gets equipped with them. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we got to bombard the planet. Uh, <laughs> so it was awesome seeing them. And to Mikazuki's credit, and really Tekken's credit, they were so good that essentially Galahorn was forced to use the day in sleeves. It's almost a compliment in a way that <laughs> you have to be defeated by some of the most powerful weapons humanity has. So yes, my, my number two, the Dane Sleeves from Iron-Blooded Orphans for being awesome, powerful, impactful, and very important to the series. That's a quality pick right there. What I loved about Galahorn's setup of Tekadin was they were like, these guys used one Dane's Leaf, so therefore they are now deserving of you know being on the receiving end of like hundreds of them. Yeah. <laughs> And you can't block Dane sleeves. Let's establish no. that too. Like we've never seen them block. Like there's there's a scene where a um a <laughs> well people p- block them with their body and they just yeah. die. <laughs> <laughs> there's a scene in, where one of the Tekken pilots is like gonna sacrifice himself by like putting this giant a kilometer by kilometer uh, block of steel. I think it was part of a shipyard between him and the Dane sleeves, and the Dane sleeves fire at it. So this thing doesn't really block it since they still punch holes through it. The best he could do was just kind of hope they wouldn't really guess where he was behind it. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that that's your best bet with the Dane sleeve. You, you essentially have to put up a, a smoke screen and hope that they don't shoot where you were actually at. <laughs> the Dane sleeve was so brutal in the show that you hated to see it coming because you knew that it was going to wreck all your favorite characters. But you also loved to see it because it was so fun to watch. It was kind of the embodiment of um, really showing that Tekken was playing checkers while Gallahorn was playing chess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they were they were doomed from the beginning. They just didn't know it. So yeah, but anyways, very cool. I hope to one day get a uh, a Gallahorn mobile suit that uses a Dane sleeve, build it, and then uh, I can destroy the uh, <laughs> the Barbados <laughs> that, that I'll buy. <laughs> you know, you you mentioned that the launchers look like a bow and arrow. What if they, what if like Nerf? Remember the old Nerf bow and arrows? What if they yeah. made like a Nerf Dainsleaf then, launcher? That would be cool. Yeah, why not? Although they'd have to upsize it, right? Because like proportionally, the Dainsleaf, it's essentially a shoulder-mounted crossbow bow, you know? Yeah, it'd have to be bigger. How about that for a group cosplay project? You could be a Dainsleaf <laughs> team. Sure, and then like someone could be like Mikazuki, just like just like <laughs> bleeding. <laughs> he's, got, he's got Dainsleaf sticking yeah, out of him. Just crushed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. It's time, Brian. We've arrived at number one. What is your number one pick for your favorite mobile suit weapon from any and all Gundam universes? So you're probably going to be disappointed in my number one, but I think number one is very iconic. So my number one is New Gundam's Fin Funnels. Wow. You know what? I'm not disappointed. And let me tell you why. Because I know you have a close relationship with New Gundam. 
you and New Gundam are like carrots and peas, right? <laughs> you you you've liked New Gundam for since I've known you. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. Continue. <laughs> so New Gundam's fin funnels. Uh, for those who don't know, there's six fin shaped bits that sit on New's backpack, sort of off to the one side. Just in general, Isaac, I think bits and funnels are some of the coolest weaponry that we have in Gundam. For me, they hit all the marks. They're beam weapons. They're controlled via thoughts, which really leans into like the new type aspect of the show in a piloty way and not so much a space magic way like Unicorn, perhaps. It's a high skill requirement, right? They're super deadly, and they just they look cool in, in animation. They're fun to watch, right, when, when they show up in a show. So I do want to talk about the difference between bits and funnels here because this is kind of funny. People often use the terms bits and funnels interchangeably, but there technically is a difference, even though no one really cares. But bits have onboard reactors for power, which enable them to operate for longer periods of time, and they don't really have to go back and recharge. Funnels, on the other hand, lack an onboard power source, um, so they are essentially battery-powered by these things called ECAPs, and they have to come back frequently to recharge once they run run out of energy. The new Gundam's fin funnels are actually bits, but they're just shaped differently which the termed to be fins <laughs> but they're called funnels there's no real reason why they're called funnels when they're not funnels they're actually bits but again it doesn't really matter because no one cares but <laughs> just I'm pointing that out they're they're fin funnels but they're actually bits so this anyway. is this is federation deception <laughs> this is this is federation propaganda striking fear into the hearts of neil zeon pilots everywhere <laughs> oh don't worry they're just funnels <gasps> they're bits <laughs> yeah <laughs> We just came out for combat. I'm pretty sure those aren't funnels. <laughs> Let me take a look at that combat footage. Oh, my God. <laughs> but I just think in general, Isaac, that, again, bits and funnels are some of the coolest weaponry, and these are probably the coolest ones, in my opinion. Wow. Or at least definitely the most iconic. Yeah. The other iconic ones I could think of are maybe the, the Cubilés bits. The, the ones we saw in Crossbone were pretty cool. But in terms of look and just iconic imagery. You look at these and you you know that they belong to the new Gundam. And it gives new Gundam that cool asymmetric shape. It turns out it looks like a cape. And especially when it's combined with that, the other asymmetric part, which is normally Gundams have two beam sabers sticking out, but the new Gundam only has one. It has a bigger beam saber on one side and then it has the funnels, um, the fin funnels on the other side. And plus these fin funnels have the extra ability Isaac, which we saw in the movie, which was the ability to create the uh, the shield, the I believe is eye field barrier, to protect New Gundam or, or whatever he wanted to protect. And I can't think of anything else in any other show or, or series or you know outside any other fictional universe that looks or behaves like this. And maybe there's something out there, but if there is, I don't know what it is. So I just think it gives New Gundam a really distinct shape and a distinct iconic weapon that really no one else uh, can can claim. And it was fun to watch in the movie. It made Amuro feel like he had the power of a hundred men or whatever on the on the battlefield there. So, uh, yeah, that's my number one. The news fin funnels. Man, there's such a cool, awesome design too. Because nothing really looks like them. No, you know mm-hmm. they're. I don't even know how to describe it. Folding trapezoid. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> I well I don't know. <laughs> Tri- triple segmented folding <laughs> funnels. <laughs> just watch it if you if you don't know what we're talking about. Just watch Shars <laughs> Counterattack. <laughs> Remote death machines. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Oh boy, I like the kind of angled way they like dock onto the uh, the new, you know, that upward kind of diagonal. It really gives new a very dis- unique look. What I like about new Gundam Isaac is it's not over designed. You look at a lot of Gundams, especially later ones, and they've got all this stuff going on. They're really busy, but new is I don't want to say simple, but you look at it and you just think, well, wow, that's pretty badass looking, and it looks like it means business. And those fin funnels look really intimidating I, I don't know what those are but i don't think i want to see what they have to do yeah absolutely <laughs> what colors would yours be on your new gundam on your oh. perfect new brian <laughs> oh man i don't know that that's a tough call um i do like the the purple light blueish that that, that the high new has so i, I think I, I like the high new scheme but the high new has different shaped funnels it's it's got a different shape in the back you know the the normal news black and white is is perfectly good with me as well well we've come to my number one and brian being able to read my mind he knows exactly (laughs) what this weapon is 
Yeah, you haven't mentioned it yet, so I know what number one is. <laughs> he knows exactly the scene I'm going to think of. He knows exactly the first time I saw it. He knows exactly what it does. He knows how it looks. And he knows the mobile suit that uses it almost exclusively, to my knowledge. Yeah. This is the heat saber used by the Dom. Now, if you remember, Xeon doesn't exactly have a ton of beam weapons lying around. Uh, so... <laughs> They tended to prefer heat weapons, like heat hawks or heat rods. Heat hawk, which is the, of course the tomahawk type axe used by the zakus a lot. The heat rod is the you know the kind of tentacle used by the uh, the guffs. And guess what? The doms were equipped with heat sabers. It's exactly like it says. It's a straight type sword, very long, almost like the height of the dom, and it heats up to the point of becoming red hot. Um, maybe even almost white hot and it allows the Dom with its, you know, ability to hover and do these very quick unorthodox attacks to slice through enemy mobile suits. And in double 83, in the first episode, it gets used to perfect effect in this incredible attack on the Torrington base. You see this Dom come in this, this poor gym pilot, it might've been his first <laughs> battle. He kind of like stands still and like shoots at the Dom, but like he's shooting from like the hip. <laughs> and the dom gets closer really dodging all the shots as it like closes in and it i think it does a spin even it does it <laughs> and does it, it takes the heat rod holds it horizontally and goes through his body goes through the gym's body and cockpit completely you know you even notice the, the heat rod kind of slowing down as it slices through and then completely going all the way through and just the torso section of the gym is all molten and melted and god knows what the what the, the <laughs> pilot looks like he must look like a hot pocket that was like left on too long <laughs> oh, so then the pepperoni <laughs> flavor yeah exactly oh there's pepperonis all over the cockpit and then you know the dom kind of like cuts finishes cutting through him and it goes on with battle Ever since seeing that back in the day, back in high school, back in Toonami Adult Swim, I, I think that was like, I don't know, that like kind of, that, that was probably my, the start of my love affair with the Dom. <laughs> I, yeah, I that saw was, that. I saw that as a little high school student. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that was your Gundam core memory, right? Yeah, that was my, that was my Gundam gasm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that this is my number one weapon. I love seeing it whenever it's used. It's not really used a ton. I think it's just incredible. There's even some scenes I think where it's it's used and I forgot what was it double eighty? I don't know. But like it's being used in the rain and you can see like the rain kind of like not even making contact with it. Like just drying essentially, evaporating before it makes contact with the activated heat rod. Oh, that's cool. Little known fact, I found this doing a little bit of research. There's a limited number of uses. You know, unlike beam weapons, which as long as you have a charge, you can make the beam. Uh, the heat rod, there's only a certain number of times you can use it before the blade is no longer viable. So, very interesting. Oh, that makes sense, actually, because yeah. I'm sure the, the, you can only heat the metal and reheat it so many times before it probably loses its shape or, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So, you get, I don't know, a handful of, a, a handful of cuts, and then <laughs> a, hopefully a computer tells you, hey, do, ditch it or... I don't know. You start going through like a, a, a gym and then it just stops. And then you're like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess this is it. Yeah. I think I'm a sitting duck. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, this is my number one. And I think Brian can agree that this is a pretty badass weapon. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty cool weapon, I got to say. And I like this pick, Isaac, because it's such a simple weapon, too. Yeah. It doesn't have to be overly complicated, right? And that's the theme of tonight's episode. It's your What is your favorite weapon? Not necessarily the one that's the most damaging or the most powerful but which one do you like the most which one created that core gundam memory for you isaac you had, clearly it was his it was the dom heat saber slicing up that poor you know gym pilot at torrington base <laughs> if i remember right in that scene isaac didn't the when the torso falls doesn't it fall backward and the gym keeps firing a little bit yeah that's a good point i think only the torso above the waist exploded and like the legs are just still there <laughs> And the Dom, the Dom just went on with his day. <laughs> yeah, he's like, okay, next. He's like, all right, I gotta keep attacking. <laughs> Everyone at that base will be talking about him for the rest of their life. <laughs> yeah, plus his little flourish at the end there. Yeah, oh yeah. If you're a Dom pilot, you're just you must be so used to spinning, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they teach you that as part of training. Like yeah, they won't issue like, you a Dom unless you can do the flourish. 
all right, before we get in the cockpit, we got to do some like ballet twirling, you know. <laughs> Trust me, you're going to appreciate this. <laughs> All right, listeners. Well, those are our top five favorite weapons overall. We reserved the right to change our opinion <laughs> from day to day <laughs> as we think of new ones. Um, and maybe we'll expand this series a little bit in the future, get a little more specific, cover a little more ground. But we want to know what your top five favorite weapons are across all the Gundam timelines. Which ones created your core Gundam memory, no matter how silly of a weapon they are? If it's your favorite, it's your favorite. And we want to hear about it. Absolutely. And, you know... If you can't think of five, what's wrong with one, three, whatever? Just let us know. Tell us about it. First time you saw it and all that. You can't like Gundam without liking mobile suit weapons. <laughs> That's right. They go hand in hand, literally. Zing. Oh, <laughs> low bridge. <laughs> all right, Isaac, take us away. All right, listeners, before you go to sleep tonight. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say polish your gun, but I don't he, think that has a, yeah. <laughs> he got, Isaac got a cut down by a heat rod mid, yeah, mid sentence. Uh, uh, I'm not going to be the only one having a Gundam gasm, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listeners, before you go sleep tonight, stand next to your bed, put your hands together, get on your knees, look up at the ceiling and hail Zeon. Good night, everybody.